the partners, the MSPs need to offer choice to the end customers, but a vendor, ISV or OEM, needs to be able to offer choices to their partners. Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning into Channel Voices, the podcast for future channel leaders, where we learn the ins and outs of partner ecosystems through casual conversations with channel professionals from a variety of industries, partner types, and geographies. My name is Maciek, and I'm your host. My guest spent eight years working in Europe with both Palo Alto Networks and Ingram Micro leading global distribution and commercial channels, advanced technologies division and EMEA public cloud go-to-market. He enjoys building teams, relationships and partnerships that accelerate business growth and foster long-term success. Today, he is committed to building relationships with managed service providers, solution providers and system integrators, as well as expanding AvPoint's global distribution networks and cloud market presence. He has two degrees from the University of California in international relations and in Russian language, as well as an executive MBA from Chapman University. He spends his free time with his wife and four children in Southern California and can often be found on a bike at a golf course or riding a wave. Jason Beal, welcome to Channel Voices. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. Fantastic. Jason, um, as the topic of the episode suggests, we'll be, t- we'll be talking about MSP. MSP stands for Managed Service Provider. From your standpoint, from your experiences, what is a Managed Service Provider? You know, from my experience, you know, the managed service provider model has, has evolved in a positive way in the past decade in, in our uh, channel ecosystem. And providers have been able to add more and more value to end customers, not only in the classic, let's say, um, procurement and management of technology, but much more so into the strategic advisory and, and consultation services for end customers. You know, a managed service provider in many ways positions themselves as a as a virtual CIO, right? So many business owners, business leaders, and executives are busy every day working in the business. And they know their business. They know their industry, but they don't always keep their finger on the pulse of the technology trends. They don't always know how to make technology a real competitive advantage, uh, a real competitive differentiator. That's where a managed service provider comes in. Sure, they can keep the lights on, make sure all the systems are up and running and all the employees have access to applications and data. But lately, we've certainly seen as technology has become more complex, those managed service providers are that virtual CIO offering those strategic advisory and consulting services to empower the business with technology. Great. So... Obviously, every vendor is different and possibly not every vendor uses an MSP. However, we see um, a bit of a surge, I suppose, um, within the ecosystems and managed service providers become so useful to to many businesses. From your point of view, um, maybe why and at what point should a vendor consider partnering with an MSP? I think on the main, if we look at the diversity of partner business models across the channel ecosystem, you know, I strongly advocate, I recommend to vendors, either hardware vendors, software vendors, service provider, you know, SaaS companies should have a channel ecosystem that has, you know, a breadth and a diversity of partner business models, you know, to have a channel strategy that might only incorporate reseller or only incorporate consultants or only incorporate MSPs, it wouldn't give that vendor and their end customers enough options. So what I advocate, what I recommend is to have a very diverse partner channel, right? What I call the modern partner and the partner of the future. MSPs are part of that and certainly they're getting more and more of a share of overall, you know, IT product and services spend. But an ISV, an OEM, 
We'll want to have some value added resellers. We'll want to have systems integrators. We'll want to have cloud consultants. We'll want to have DevOps partners. And certainly we'll want to have a strong MSP strategy. So I think in brief, MSPs are an important part of a channel strategy. Certainly vendors need to consider how do they work with MSPs? How do they attract them? How do they make them successful? But they're a part of a broader and more diverse channel ecosystem for those vendors. Right. And with, in terms of MSPs, we can even go deeper and talk about the specialized MSPs, right? The MSSPs. And we see that trend even within a traditional channel ecosystem or partnerships where vendors would, would want their partners to certify in certain areas, take additional training, become more specialized within you know, maybe their SaaS business or whatever it may be. And from from your point of view, you know, when you're going the route with MSPs, should you be looking at an MSP with a very large footprint or would you rather go down the niche type of route where you're looking after those specialized MSPs? Yeah, so there too, it's important for a vendor also to have a diversity even within its MSP subset of its channel ecosystem, again, depending on the size and the needs of that end customer base. If you're working with uh, SMBs, in many cases, they might outsource nearly the entirety of their uh, IT strategy and management to a MSP. If you're working on large enterprise, if you're working on federal government, then it might just be a certain segment, a certain piece of that IT infrastructure that is outsourced to MSPs. So as a vendor, sure, specialization is critical. I'd say it's critical in three ways. Like one, from an industry or vertical market perspective. I want to make sure as a vendor that I have MSPs that really can go deep and service customers in particular vertical markets, right? Oil and gas or retail and hospitality or medical and and, 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 um, hospitals. Because they'll know that customer, they'll know their lines of business applications, third-party integrations, they'll understand regulatory and compliance requirements specific to that industry. So specialization by vertical and by industries is critical for vendors working with MSPs. You know, second is the kind of technology specialization and having expertise in a particular tech stack. Uh, so, you know, are you a, you know, deep in your Microsoft competencies? Um, maybe it's deep in, you know, Google, their workplace and GCP. So if I'm a vendor and I have managed service providers, again, they can help their end customers really know throughout their tech stack and help my solution integrate and function with that. And then lastly, you know, we talked about uh, talked earlier about this kind of the size and scope of the end users. MSP should understand, should have the expertise around business sizes, um, what they need to do with mid-market companies, what they need to do with enterprise, public sector, fed or sled. That can help me as a vendor have a MSP partner ecosystem that can cover all parts of the end customer uh, landscape. And let's think about a scenario where a, a vendor might be considering adding MSP to their partner ecosystem. And how how would they go about finding the right MSP for them? And maybe how would you recommend approaching a potential MSP partnership? Yeah, I think that, you know, nowadays we talk a lot about choice. Okay. So not only do the partners, the MSPs need to offer choice to the end customers, but a vendor, ISV or OEM, needs to be able to offer choices to their partners. Um, when we talk about choice, we might talk about pricing. Um, we might talk about commitments. Is it month to month? Is it annual? Um, we might talk about the uh, how do they go to market? Do they want to have an integrated solution? Do they want to drive a lot of automation, a lot of workflow with the solution? Or are they going to look at it more of a, of a point product? So a, a, a vendor really needs to be able to offer choices to fit the needs of the MSPs so that they can offer choices 
and fit the needs of the end, end customer. I can tell you most of the partners with whom I'm speaking, they will have a, a large portion of their business be monthly recurring, but they also have a notable portion of the business that is still a project uh, business. It still has some upfront professional services. It still has some license or some, or some product sales. And it's because they position themselves to be agile to meet the needs, you know, the budget and the balance sheet needs of various uh, end customers. And that, that that's very interesting because that agility kind of leads me to the next question, which is, you know, to typical MSP, an agreement with an MSP, what does that entail? Is it is it only the additional services that they offer, that consultancy? Do they also sell product? Um, what are the typical SLA or maybe pricing models that come into play w- with a, a partnership with partnership with an MSP? Yeah, there too. I mean, I've I I, I also see these um, this diversity of choice, right? Whether it's a uh, truly month to month contracts that that don't require any sort of commitment and can be canceled any time versus, hey, we're going to bill you monthly, but a partner or a vendor still wants an, an annual commitment, right? I've seen this, the advantages of having the budgets be very predictable, right? Consistent, same price, same, you know, cost per month for an end customer. But I've also seen where true utility computing, right? True pay as you go is also favored by an end customer. So, you know, you mentioned that word agility. I, I, I totally agree. Um, I talk to a lot of partners who say, you know what? There's an effort and a cost to go acquire a customer. All the marketing and sales expense to acquire a customer. There's a cost to set up that customer. I've got to build dashboards for them. I've got to turn them on my, my monitoring tools and, and my service management tools. I've got to learn their environment. In some cases, I've got to put agents out there and and deploy the technology so that I can pick up certain data. There's a cost to setting up this customer and for me to be able to provide them those management advisory services. I don't want them to be able to cancel with two or three months if somebody comes along who might make them a, a different promise or a better price. So we're looking for an annual commitment. Again, the how do we pay do I own the equipment and the and the license is entitled to me as a managed service provider? Does the end customer own the equipment and it's entitled to them? Do we pay cash up front or do some form of financing? Those things, yes, we have choices. We can meet the, the budget and the balance sheet of the end customer. But I, I do see more and more MSPs want a, a quote unquote contract or, or, or want a uh, commitment. Right. And with obviously so many components being involved with in the business of an MSP, as a vendor, what is the best way to to measure an MSP's performance? Well, I, you know, the two KPIs that you know, I've tracked in the business for over a decade that I think are still incredibly relevant today are your you know, the increase in ARPU, your average revenue per user and then your attrition or your churn, okay? And I'm underlying both of those would be your the, the customer lifetime value, right? What did it cost to acquire the customer? What does it cost to manage um, that customer from a, from a technology and a human capital perspective? And then ultimately how much uh, revenue that you're getting and how long you're holding on. But um, ARPU is... is Really important because, you know, you want to be able to provide the right service at the right price to your end customer, but you also want to slowly get more and more of their, you know, IT spend, including, you know, products and consulting um, as, as the MSP. You want to keep adding on certain services or if you're empowering those businesses to grow, then you're going to get more and more monthly recurring revenue from each of those partners. And then the churn is extremely important, right? There's always another partner. There's always a competitor trying to go after your customer. 
Your customer is always doing their research online as to which technologies or which providers are out there. And so we want to make sure that you reduce the, the churn. So those two KPIs, your ARPU and then your attrition rates are, are critical KPIs for an MSP. Recurring revenue, those um, that keeps coming up and up and again. Um, I've just done a, a webinar um, uh, two weeks ago on maximizing um, the renewals revenue through channel. And it was a very interesting discussion. And we talked about, you know, many things, what what a vendor should do to encourage partners to, to go after that and reduce churn and maximize yeah. um, renewal revenue, but also take the opportunity of, of that re anniversary of a contract, let's call it, and start upselling and cross-selling, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sometimes look at that word renewal as as sometimes it can be a bit of a danger, right? So I favor more of an evergreen model. If I'm an MSP, I sign a new customer. I ask for an annual commitment. But within that contract, after the first 12 months, there's an evergreen contract that says, then we just start rolling into the 13th and the 14th and the nth month. Rather than having a the opportunity to potentially lose the customer because you're you're going to call them and you're going to say hey, this this 12 month contract is over do you want to continue business with us do you want to renew it for another 12 months that gives that end customer potentially the incentive or the opportunity to go maybe price shop you maybe look at what else is available I always liken it in, in, in our world, right? How many monthly recurring services do we pay for? I have, you know, I have Netflix, for example. That just bills every month and I never question it. It just hits the credit card and it goes. Now, if somebody called me from Netflix and said, hey, Jason, you're coming up on 12 months. Do you want to renew? I might think, well, Am I really using Netflix? Am I watching enough shows? Should I look at Hulu? Should I look at Prime? That might give me an opportunity to move the business. So I rather, you know, again, renewals can be good because like like you said, it can we can upsell and we can add on a service, but really you can do that at any time. Sometimes renewals, one will cost you more from a, a sales resource standpoint, and it could introduce the opportunity for the end customer to move away from your service. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and in terms of the bigger picture, I suppose, when it comes to the revenue contribution by an MSP, how does that compare to your typical you know, reseller, value-added reseller, or a referral partner? Well, the, the beauty of the annuity business is the predictability, right? So and you have this, the quote-unquote, the smoothness of revenue, right? And that predictability, which ultimately helps from um, yeah, increasing your company valuation. If you're doing a lot of professional services, very spiky business, you might have a big month or a big quarter, and then there might not be big services projects for another few months or quarters. If you're selling a lot of product there too, it might be very cyclical depending on the end user industry or, or depending on refresh cycles. A, the, the beauty of a monthly recurring and an annuity business is that it's much more flat. The cash flow is much better. The, the valuation multiple is, is multiples higher than that. And so it just from a business management, financial pan, planning, cash flow perspective, it's a much more beautiful business than kind of the spiky PS projects and resale product business. I believe you have, I've just seen it on LinkedIn, I believe you have just launched a new partner program at Point. Uh, can you tell us what does that new program entail? Absolutely. So we launched on July 13th, our first global partner program at Point, uh, where we're bringing this collaboration security and the cyber resilience opportunity um, to uh, partners all around the globe. It's been ex very well received. We had the opportunity really since it was our first global partner program to have a blank canvas and, and to build you know, a, a partner program for the modern partner and the partner of the future. I've, I've been in the industry quite a while. I've worked at vendors and distributors and, and have had the, the pleasure and honor of seeing a lot of different hardware and software vendors partner programs. And 
unfortunately, many of those are still designed for the old resale model, even for a hardware resale model. So these legacy partner programs aren't always applicable for the modern partner. We wanted to build a program that was that was simple, that was easy for partners to understand, and that was adaptable to these various partner business models, whether you're a systems integrator, whether you're an MSP, a VAR, a cloud consultant, a DevOps partner. If you may focus on some resell, on services, on managed services, on IP co-creation, that's where we built our program, right? Most importantly, we've been talking throughout this podcast a lot around KPIs and multiples and revenues and recurring Partners these days are interested in a total economic opportunity around a particular vendor's technology, right? AbPoint, we provide incredible technology with this digital collaboration security platform. But what we're most interested is if you sell a dollar of AvPoint, how much is that generating an economic opportunity for the partners? So that's what we built our program. Help the partners to maximize that total multiple around our technology. And so far, we've gotten really good feedback. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work with our partners to really help them to capture and maximize that economic opportunity around the AppPoint licenses or services. That's re that's really good to hear, and that that's something that I think is a, definitely a trend for the past couple of years, and it's that simplicity of a partner program, right? Make sure that partners understand how do I interact with the vendor, how do I resell or add additional solutions onto a product that I'm selling for on on their behalf, but. I, I need to understand how am I going to be measured? Uh, how am I going to get paid on this? Um, and simplicity is really something that keeps coming up every single time. Whoever I speak to within the channel, they all talk about that, you know, make your program simplified. Don't have hundreds of pages. And then a partner would need to potentially even, you know, hire someone full time to run numbers based on the mm -hmm. rules of the program just to make sure that they actually are still making money. Yeah, we, we did a lot of uh, crowdsourcing. We had some focus groups. We worked with even industry analysts when we were designing the program. And that feedback, what you just mentioned, came out loud and clear. Partners are juggling dozens of these vendor programs and vendor portals and rebate program. They said, keep it simple. We wanted to reduce the barriers of entry. We wanted to keep it very simple, easy to engage, easy to understand um, on, on, you know, how they make, how they can make money, how they build a, you know, a holistic practice around AvPoint. Um, and then we wanted it to be adaptable to the local market, right? The feedback that we had also received in the crowdsourcing and in our partner focus groups was that many partner programs are designed for typically, you know, one big U S market. And how you do business and how partners do business and capture opportunities and work with the vendors and monetize the, the, the partnership in the United States in a nearly 400 million person, you know, single language, single culture market is very different than the rest of world. Medium sized countries or small countries across LATAM, uh, EMEA, JPAC. So we built a program that had a, what we call this global framework but with local adaptability. And we wanted to empower our local sales and channel and marketing teams to use the, the bones of the program, but to right size it for the partners in their local country. And that, that too, we've received really, really positive feedback. It, it, again, I go back to your word agility. That's part of the agility, empowering them to adapt that partner program on the local level. But that's been really critical, we believe, in the early success in the program. Very good to hear. And I'd say that was probably a, um, a big undertaking when it comes to, you know, simplifying something that is complex because of nature of the business, but also make it so that it is adaptable based on geographical location. Right. Um, and just bring it back a little bit to to the topic of the MSP. Mm -hmm. Could you share with, you know, whoever is listening to this episode right now and thinking about expanding their channel and introducing um, the new uh, type of a partner in, in the form of an MSP? 
what would be your top three uh, pieces of advice? So, you know, cybersecurity and, you know, the role of security in uh, digital transformation being made possible for those vendors by MSPs is, I would say, paramount, right? MSPs are really the backbone of this kind of exponential growth in this move to the cloud, digital transformation and, and technology adoption, right? By adding MSPs to, to a vendor strategy. They can help end customers have a choice, right? Again, do I build? Do I outsource? Do I buy? Do I do I rent? Uh, to capitalize on the addressable market. So that's number one: security and digital transformation empowered by MSPs. Number two, you know, I've been hearing from the field that MSPs and end customers really want to consolidate or reduce the number of different vendors and technologies in the IT stack particularly nowadays where we have um, such a shortage of IT talent, right? There's just a skills gap out there um, and we're at probably over full employment in our industry. It's harder, right, to have so many different tools that you need to be trained on and you need to hire experts and they have different dashboards and the data isn't integrated and shared. So, this vendor consolidation trend, this platform play, and if you're an ISV, ensuring that you've got integration into these platforms and into marketplaces to reduce the cost of operation and the cost of manageability is critical. Number three, in fact, at the uh, partner conference this week, we heard a lot of this on the main stage and in breakouts. Partner enablement is still the critical success factor for growing a you know, healthy and fruitful relationship with MSPs, right? Partner training and resources are critical for a vendor to introduce to MSPs. Technical training, sales training, marketing resources, on-demand tools, demo environments, sandbox environments, 24-7 human support for those MSPs like an AbPoint provides, all of that is critical, right? You can have a lot of partners sign up for your program, but if you aren't providing them with the proper enablement, then you're just underserving your MSPs. And you end up with your typical 28 year rule, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much for, for sharing this, Jason. There is there's the question I ask of every single guest it gets um, you know it helps us to get to know you who you are how you got into the channel what's the one thing you wish you knew before starting your career in channel you know i've i've never you know what they say you know carried a bag and sold to end users right certainly i've had a ton of opportunity to work with end customers you know alongside partners and then you know within the different companies that that I've worked for, we've done executive briefings and you know, we've done round tables and panels with end customers. But my advice and something that I wish I had knew from, from the start as a, as a channel professional and a channel executive, I would have you know, spent much more time with the uh, end customers, right? Sometimes I've seen with employees at vendors who've always worked in the channel or distributors who've always worked two steps away from the end customers, they can be what I call living in this channel bubble, right? Um, we've heard this expression, Stephen Covey's begin with the end in mind. I always say begin with the end customer in mind, right? The end, the, the vendor's sales team is the tip of the spear. The customer is the one that ultimately is driving the technology need and the technology utilization. So in my history in the channel and working with distributors, if I would have known more, I would have really much more biased my my time and my attention um, to the end customer. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing that with us as well. Jason, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for sharing with us all that knowledge around MSPs, how they go to market to, to end users, and how do vendors work with them. I'm sure everyone listening to this will find it very, very valuable. Um, to you and to Avpoint, wishing you continued success and hope to speak with you soon. 
Thank you so much. Um, again, great opportunity. I, I enjoyed the uh, the conversation, and I, I hope the uh, the listeners too have uh, taken a couple of key nuggets away. Thank you so much, Jason. And that's a wrap for this episode. I do hope you found it valuable, and if you did, please make sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also follow Channel Voices Podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Or just visit channelvoices.com where you can send me a message or leave a voicemail. All of the links are listed in the show notes. And once again, I appreciate you tuning in today. Until next time. Thank you.